there are some paths that we're on, as we've been discussing, which if we continue on them will be destructive, not just to ourselves and other species. Can we incorporate that awareness of ourselves as a geological force to be not just, uh, you know, to be self-aware in the deep sense where our behavior is uh, a result of that awareness? And um, so I, I talk about that as a fundamentally different kind of change. There's the kind of change where we are clever and building machines and, um, and changing the planet without any long-term plan or awareness of the consequences. And there's plenty of examples of that. <laughs> you know, like open the newspaper on any day. Uh, you know, that's climate change so far. We haven't, we, 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 we can see that it's a problem, but we haven't really reined it in. And then there's the possibility of the, another kind of change where we incorporate the knowledge of, of the consequences of our actions into those actions and change course. And in searching for examples of that, I actually, I think there are a few examples, but the best example is the ozone layer. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of the Real Organic Project a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label that distinguishes soil-grown crops and pasture-raised livestock. You just heard from NASA astrobiologist David Grinspoon about how we humans are slowly recognizing our role as a geological force in spite of the catastrophic implications of our actions. Before we jump into today's episode, know that after two months of twice weekly episodes, we'll be releasing just one Real Organic podcast a week going forward on Tuesdays. Secondly, all of the interviews we release are part of our annual Real Organic Symposium, which you can now watch all five sessions for free at realorganicsymposium.org and see for yourself why it was such a hit. Now let's get back to my co-director, Dave Chapman's interview with astrobiologist David Grinspoon. Welcome everybody um, to another Real Organic podcast. And today I'm talking with David Grinspoon, NASA astrobiologist, um, author, professor, and musician. And um, David, I loved what Marcelo Gleiser said when you spoke at Dartmouth, which is that um, being a, a, a NASA astrobiologist means that it's now okay to seriously study life on other planets. So, you know, the world keeps changing. So welcome. Thank you very much. I'm uh, happy to be uh, speaking with you. Yeah. I... I Greatly enjoyed your talk at Dartmouth. So, and I greatly enjoyed your book, Earth in Human Hands. It's a tremendous book, which I saw got the uh, best science book of 2016 from NPR's um, Science Friday. Congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, I know it's a little strange to have an astrobiologist invited to participate in a symposium about, about agriculture, but I think that the closer we look and the more we learn, the more obvious it becomes that everything is connected. And I found what you talked about to be directly related to what we're working on here. So let's, let's just dive in. Uh, Earth in Human Hands. How did you name that? And, and what, what, was, what was the goal in that book? That book came out of a project that I uh, did at the Library of Congress. Um, I got a sort of unusual job. I was the inaugural chair of astrobiology at the Library of Congress. It was a position they created where they wanted to have people come and work on the intersection of astrobiology and um, other humanistic questions. And astrobiology, in case anyone, um, for some crazy reason, anyone is not steeped in it, uh, is the study of um, life in the universe uh, and the question of can we apply what we know about life on Earth and what we know about other planets to the question of where there may be life and how we may find it. But for my project that I applied and then was chosen for this position at the Library of Congress, I chose to look at humans on Earth through the lens of astrobiology and this question of the uh, what people call the Anthropocene epoch, the, the notion that we've started a new uh, phase of Earth history defined by the actions of, of humans, and how, uh, how that um, notion of the, the Anthropocene looks, if you look at it through the lens of um, astrobiology, which to me means thinking of deep time and sort of whole planet changes. In, in, in terms of planetary history, 
Um, what do we humans really represent? That was the nature of that project at the Library of Congress, and that ultimately led to this book, Earth and Human Hands. I originally had a title in mind, um, which was Terra Sapiens, which means wise earth, which is a concept I develop in the book. There's a chapter called Terra Sapiens, and that's my notion that if we really are able in this imagined uh aspirational future to incorporate what we know about the planet and what we understand about our role in the planet if we're able to incorporate that into how we behave on the planet uh, and uh, in other words turn our knowledge of planetary functioning and, and our self-knowledge into wisdom and achieve a, a, a sort of more mature relationship with the planet my name for that state is Terra Sapiens which means sort of wise earth and I wanted to call the book Terra Sapiens with a subtitle, which I still think would have been a cool title. But my publisher probably rightly thought, well, if people see that in a bookstore, they're going to be like, you know, it, it's not going to grab them because it'll be a phrase they've never heard and they'll just move on. And I get it with publishers. You want something that people are going to actually read. As an author, that's not a, <laughs> not a bad goal either. <laughs> so uh, we, we brainstormed and wanted to come up with something that actually sort of encapsulated in, in real English words, um, what, what uh, the book was about, which is earth and human hands, uh, what it means to be a geological force and become aware of the fact that we're a geological force. And, um, you, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing to sort of ponder, but hopefully it's also useful in that that knowledge can be can be the beginning of wisdom of approaching our role on the planet from a more informed um and then thereby hopefully more sustainable perspective. Okay. So just to catch up people a little bit with, with your thinking, which is, which is uh, very powerful. So you you have a, a marvelous perspective of deep time or big time, and you're looking at earth as, so how old are we? So the planet is four and a half billion years old. And life, or as we sometimes refer to it, Gaia, the planetary biospheric organism, is something like 4 billion years old. So from that perspective, we've been here a long time. We're not newbies, flash in the pan. But on the other hand, you know, animals have been here, any animals at all have been here for about um, you know five five or six hundred million years, so a, a pretty small fraction of that. And then hominids, uh, the the genus that we humans come from, have been here for a few million years. And then we uh, anatomically modern humans have been here for you know may, we're still figuring that out, but maybe a hundred thousand years. And then of course uh, human societies who have been not just hunter gatherers, but actually farming. Uh, in uh, in stationary places and building villages and cities and so forth are, um, you know, that we count in probably 10,000 years or so, maybe a little longer. But the point is, uh, when you say, how long have we been here? You, ha you sort of start zo zooming in on who, who the we is in this question. That's and that, right. that question of who do we mean by we actually comes back a lot in this conversation when you talk about our role on the planet. Yeah, that's right. So... Could you talk a little bit about the Gaia hypothesis? And I know that you have actual personal connections to the to that theory. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? It's a very important way of looking at. I think all there's so many things about developing perspective so that we develop our understanding, so that we become a little bit wiser. So could you talk about Gaia hypothesis? Sure. So the Gaia hypothesis, uh, in its very basic form, is the idea that life on Earth is not just a collection of organisms on a de otherwise dead planet, but that the life itself um, forms a global totality um, that is really inextricable from the physical functioning of the planet. In other words, the biosphere, or what we can call by the more poetic name Gaia, um, which is named after an Earth goddess, is really composed of all the organisms on Earth and the systems that they interact with. So in that sense, 
it's not just you and I and our bodies and our, our microbiomes and all the organisms inside of us and all the, every, the things we eat and then the things that grow off of what we excrete. Obviously, those are part of Gaia, but it's also the gases that we're exchanging, you know, that, that we're breathing out and breathing in. And the, so you have these great cycles of carbon and sulfur and nitrogen and water and so forth. And those, those are part of Gaia too, the circulatory fluids, if you will. So there are all these uh, analogies with organisms that go quite deep. And one interesting thing about the history of Gaia is that it came out of uh, astrobiology in the sense that the founder of Gaia, uh, who was really James Lovelock, and then really we we associate it with, uh, with Lovelock and, and Lynn Margulis, who really the, if you will, the father and mother of Gaia. Um, and when Lovelock first came up with this idea, he was actually working for NASA, trying to help them. He was employed as a consultant to help them come up with ideas for how to search for life on Mars. They were planning a mission which eventually became the Viking lander, which was the first thing to land on Mars and look, look for life there. And they went to Lovelock, who was an experimental chemist, and said, what would you do? What would you put on this lander to find life on Mars? And Lovelock, who had done a lot of work thinking about and, and building instruments to study atmospheric gases, he actually concluded, and NASA didn't really like this answer. He said, you know what? You don't need to send this spacecraft to Mars <laughs> to look for life. All you need to do is look at the atmosphere because life uh, has a global uh, impact on, on its planet. If you look at Earth... Uh, our atmosphere is so different from what it would be like as a lifeless planet. All the oxygen, not just oxygen, but methane and these mixtures of, of, uh, of gases that are out of equilibrium where something is obviously perturbing the system. It, a lifeless planet would not have all that oxygen and methane mixed together. They would quickly react and it, it would be like Venus and Mars. You'd have a carbon dioxide atmosphere. So Lovelock's big insight was that life is something that globally perturbs a planet and that was sort of the beginning of it and then he and Leon Margulis wrote this really landmark paper um, published in I believe it was 1975 or 74 um, called um, I'm going to mangle the title I'm not going to get it exactly right but it was it was a global regulation of and for the biosphere the idea that life regulates the planet in various ways and those those alterations to the planet are such that they allow for life to perpetuate itself so then in that sense it's homeostasis it's like an organism where you the concept of homeostasis is uh it's the way that we as organisms in all these different ways regulate our internal environments like your temperature when you're healthy is always you know 98.6 fahrenheit and the ph of your blood is always uh you know right around seven and all these other things it's not just accidental you've got all these feedback loops and cycles in your physiology that are keeping your internal environment such that it's good for your cells to keep doing what they do and their great insight was that the totality of the biosphere does that that life feeds back in all these complex ways with itself and with the physical earth to keep the planet sort of healthy in a healthy range that the climate and the composition of seawater and um, something you know more about than I do, but the, the composition of the soil um, and all these uh, factors are over the long run uh, they're affected by life, but it's not just that life affects the environment. It's that life actually regulates it in the sense that keeps it in a healthy zone. That if it starts to stray one way or the other from the, the sort of more optimal conditions, that then that triggers feedback loops in various uh, organisms that um, then sort of push it back, nudge it back to the uh, safe zone. So, uh, so that, that's the Gaia hypothesis. And it was very, very controversial um, because they said of and for the biosphere. So people said, oh, wait a minute, that's tele tele teleology. You're saying that life actually is trying to, it it's almost implies a kind of consciousness. And that really rubbed people the wrong way um, because it wasn't just like they were describing a mechanism. They, it was almost like they were describing 
a giant global brain. And then Lovelock and Margulis kind of backed off that language and said, well, no, 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 it's not that we were just being poetic. It's we're just describing the way life interacts with the planet. And Gaia sort of over time became integrated in the way Earth scientists think about the way the Earth functions. And, and today, a lot of Earth scientists won't admit to you that they're influenced by Gaia. And they'll say, uh, they'll describe what they do as Earth system science. And Earth system science is Gaia science. Because what's happened since they proposed the Gaia hypothesis in the 1970s is that the role of biology in Earth systems has become recognized. And nobody today can do a climate model or, a, you know, a model of soil evolution or a model of, uh, you know, any large scale important model of how some system on the earth works without including the uh, contributions of, you know, mostly microbes, but other organisms as well. And so in that sense, the Gaian perspective has kind of taken over earth system science, although it's funny, you'll you'll uh, encounter a lot of earth scientists who say, oh, no, we don't believe in the Gaia hypothesis because, uh, you know, and, and and it's still controversial because people interpret what it means different ways. But the the core thought of that deep integration of life with the systems of the planet, um, that's what Gaia is. And indeed, it has kind of taken over the way Earth system scientists think. Yeah. And uh, what occurs to me is it has not taken over the way that most corporations think. Indeed. Um, so we see a conflict here. And you know, what you're suggesting in the Gaia hypothesis is a very uh, sophisticated, very simple, but very sophisticated way of looking at what's happening. And, and what you see as a problem, what you see as a solution are quite different from somebody who sees things as, I don't know, raw materials there for our benefit. And uh, consequences are really something for somebody else to deal with. We'll get back to that because I think that that um, that is about you know Terra Sapiens is that understanding. But let's go back for a, a bit. So in in your book, which is a marvelous uh, exploration of of deep time, and you know for me it gave me a very different vision of geez what's going on and our very tiny role in this in this long history. So you have suggested that there have been five major extinction events in the planet's history. Could you talk about that? Yeah. So, uh, you know, extinction is something that, of course, is a part of the history of life. Um, and, and we tend to think of it as something uh, negative to be avoided for obvious reasons, because there's certain, you know, out of control rate of extinction right now that we're, we're causing. But in the overall history of life, uh, it's sort of a necessary part of, you know, if you're going to have evolution, um, then um, you have the uh, ultimately the disappearance of old forms and the appearance of new forms on the planet. And so there's always some some level of extinction through history. But there if you make a chart of the extinction rate over time, it's not it has not been constant. There have been these events um, at, at the most extreme called mass extinctions where there are these sharp peaks um, and then the extinction rate goes down for a while and then there'll be another sharp peak and there have been um, many smaller peaks but there have been five um, really um, marked the you know, five that stand out if you make that graph of extinction rate over history and probably the most famous one um, just because the story is so dramatic is uh, what we used to call the Cretaceous Tertiary Extinction, now it's Cretaceous Paleo Paleogene Extinction. But at any rate, the one 65 million years ago that where the dinosaurs uh, and um, actually about 90% of species all got wiped out at that time. Um, and it was a mystery for a long time. You could see in the fossil record that there was a rapid change at that time in the dinosaurs, which are, you know, these very charismatic fossils, they just suddenly stop. And, and a lot of other changes happened at that time, too. Now we have very good evidence that that was the moment when an asteroid struck the Earth. And we've, in fact, found the crater down in the Yucatan Peninsula, Mexico. Um, 
that's the most dramatic one. And and again, you think, well, that that's really sad that that happened. All those species died out. Um, it is from one perspective. From another perspective, if that hadn't happened, we wouldn't be here. Um, and everything we love, um, all the other, other modern species wouldn't be here either. It's not all just about us. Um, but if you're a fan of human culture, which I am, despite our failings, if you love music and art and literature and all these things, n poetry, none of that would be here <laughs> if that, if that catastrophe hadn't happened. And, and all the, all the other modern species we love, most of them wouldn't be here either. So it's one of these kind of funny things. It's a catastrophe, but, uh, do I wish it hadn't happened? I'm not so sure. Uh, that, that was the, uh, the most dramatic one, but, the, but actually there was a much larger one, the one that we informally call the great dying. 250 million years ago, um, the, uh, the PT, the Permian Triassic, these are just the names of the layers in the geologic time scale. And that's the boundary between the Permian and the Triassic that, um, came very close to wiping out all life on earth. That's the closest Gaia has come to an extinction event. Although as Lynn Margulis famous, famously said once, um, Gaia is a tough bitch. <laughs> by which she means it's pretty hard to, to hurt Gaia. We can hurt ourselves, but ultimately, and we could bother Gaia, but ultimately we're not going to do in Gaia. We, Gaia might go on fine without us. And the, the Permal Triassic extinction probably was a much more traumatic event on the earth than, than our influence ever, ever could be. Um, and we're still trying to figure out the details of what happened then, but it seems as though it started with massive outpourings of volcanic magma and um, gases in, in Siberia. Huge, huge outpouring of lava and carbon dioxide and other substances in those gases that were poisonous, nickel and things like that, that basically um, changed the environment so rapidly and so profoundly that uh, life couldn't keep up and almost everything died out. So and then yeah. and then there there are a few other events. We don't have to go through all of them, but that's that's what we mean when we talk about a mass extinction. Yeah, one of the things that's so striking to me about that is, um, you know, to put it in a really simple phrase, it's clear that it happens. That what we take for granted as this is how it's always been isn't how it's always been, and that it's not how it always will be. That's right. Um, we have an illusion of stability. Um, in part because we've been lucky, <laughs> but the Earth over you go over a long enough time period, and um, you know the Earth is not a stable place. And and one thing I, I talk about in the book, if I may, is how that changeable nature of the planet, which seems scary, um, and is scary on any given day when there's a natural disaster, but it's inextricably inextricably linked to the aspect of our planet which allows life to be here which is that we live on this planet with this cycling interior and um dynamic atmosphere so we live on the interface of these two heat engines inside the earth is churning like i always tell my students it's like a lava lamp there's blobs of stuff coming up from the interior and blobs falling down and that is fueling plate tectonics and moving the continents around and it leads to scary things like earthquakes and volcanoes but it's also what ultimately sustains the earth because it it uh, feeds these cycles of um you know nitrogen and iron and all these things that are nutrients um the earth never gets stale because it's it's recycling its interior and at the same time you have this exterior uh heat engine you know driven by the sun where the atmosphere is in motion and that leads to scary things like tornadoes and hurricanes, but that's also what fuels, um, again, the atmospheric cycles and the hydrological cycle and the carbon cycle and all these things that sustain life. So it's sort of this dual-sided nature of our planet. The, dy the, the dynamic um, aspect of our planet can sometimes get a little bit too much for a stable surface environment and, and you know, a, a calm, happy existence. But it's also what ultimately has made our planet so fertile by fueling these great cycles that life kind of feeds off of. Good. So can we can we touch on one of those uh, mass extinction events, which was the evolution of cyanobacteria? Because I think yeah. that's 
That's got to be a special chapter, doesn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's really interesting, especially in light of some of the changes that are happening on the planet now that we're grappling with, um, to realize that the greatest environmental catastrophe in Earth history happened as a result of uh, of cyanobacteria two and a half billion years ago. Um, with it's what we call the oxygen catastrophe, when the atmosphere was flooded with oxygen by these little green guys who had figured out how to do photosynthesis. Um, and at that time, oxygen was a poison for life because organic matter reacts powerfully with oxygen. That's what makes things burn, right? That's why a log will burn. And that's also how we fuel ourselves when we eat food and we breathe in oxygen in a controlled way we're reacting that oxygen with food and you know every cell in our body has these little um you know factories that run off of those reactions where because oxygen reacting with with organic chemicals with organic matter releases powerful energy it's exothermic reaction so that same power of those reactions when oxygen first appeared on the planet and life was not equipped to utilize that, uh, it, it was poison. It will, a lot of bacteria, if, the, if, if they're not equipped to metabolize oxygen, it, it, it kills them. So here are these, you know, innocent cyanobacteria. They discover this great new energy source and they say, oh, we're going to exploit this energy source. And what do they do? They pollute the entire atmosphere and lead to a mass extinction. So it's sort of a, a parable, right, for our, our modern times, except, of course, there's a difference between the cyanobacteria and us because we can look around and go, oh, look what we're doing to the planet. I don't think the cyanobacteria had that ability, but it is true that we're not the first creatures to come along and radically change the planet in, in the exploitation of an energy source in a way that is detrimental to other creatures. So... Uh, you know, then then that leads to the interesting question of, uh, you know, what what's different about us from the cyanobacteria? And you start getting into questions of uh, awareness and taking responsibility. And then and then you have to ask, well, do we really have that <laughs> or is it just something that we can sort of postulate? <laughs> yeah, that is it is a huge question for us. Um, so I, I want to go into that. But my my first question is, do you believe that right now we are facing another mass extinction event? It's a great question. We are, I mean, if you just put aside the question of like, can we change our behavior and what's, let's look at our crystal ball and predict the future. If you just look at what's happening now and the rate at which species are going extinct um, due to, you know, changes in land use and climate change and all that, we have not yet caused a mass extinction, but we're on the curve that if we continue that curve, then a hundred years from now or so, it will be as much of a mass extinction as the, um, you know, as these other huge ones in the history of the planet. You know, way before it actually got to that level, we'd be in trouble because we would have done enough to the planet to, um, you know, uh, to legitimately, um, you know, challenge our, our continued existence. But so, you know, the question of do I believe that we'll stay on that course and, and cause another mass extinction is another one we can get into. But but strictly speaking, we are on the path to sort of being in the beginning stages of um, what what some have called the sixth great mass extinction. Yeah. Yeah. So. You know, I had conversations after I heard you talk at Dartmouth with professors that I know there. And, um, you know, I, I came out of your talk going, this is pretty serious. And, and I, asked, I asked people, well, do you, did you agree with David? Do you, did you agree with what he said? Or is this sort of a fringy thing? And they said, no, no, no. 99% of the faculty agree with him. And I said, well, I wonder then why the curriculum hasn't changed. And, you know, it's a serious question, which is uh, if we believe that we're facing 
a, a level of threat to our existence, then why isn't our education, at the very least, transformed? And I'm curious, you, you know, you've taught, you've taught at the, at the college level, and you're obviously very involved with a lot of people who are in that world. What are your thoughts about that? I mean, what's your idea of a good education? What's your idea of an of a educated person, a, a, somebody who is 22 and comes out of that and is ready to cope with the problems of our world? Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm always a glass half full kind of person. And so the, my first reaction to your question is I do see it changing. Whether it's changing rapidly and thoroughly enough is a legitimate question. But um, the, uh, you know, the, the um, what's it called? The, the, the uh, national education standards um, do mention climate change now. Uh, they didn't the last revision. Is it front and center enough? No. But at least it's in there. There's a foot in the door for it. Um, and I do see a lot of um, college curriculum curricula now integrating climate change. Again, uh, is it enough? Is it, is it equal to the, you know, it, it, somebody who's really looking at this clearly, knowing what we know about the planet and our role in it, it looms really large. Uh, and does it loom large enough in the curriculum? Probably not, uh, but it's at least moving in the right direction. I certainly see um, younger faculty, not just in the obvious departments uh, of environmental science and so forth, but it, it, certainly in astronomy classes now, um, at least the professors I know, so there might be a selection effect here, but when we do our unit on the earth and on planetary climate, we always include um, a bit about climate change. Because when you compare earth to other planets, what you're doing is looking at, uh, you know, if you compare earth to Venus and Mars, you're looking at different levels of greenhouse effect. And the fact that we can predict climate on those planets or measure climate and it conforms to our models shows that our climate models work in a different way than just testing them on Earth. And the fact that uh, Mars is colder than the Earth and Venus is hotter than the Earth in the amount that we predict reflects uh, the fact that carbon dioxide really does change climate. And then you go from that to the, to the Keeling curve showing that carbon dioxide is changing on Earth and you say, Put all this together, the evidence from other planets, our ability to model what's happening on those planets, and then look how this planet's atmosphere is changing. You know, two plus two equals four. And, and you know, hopefully you get light bulbs to come on in a different way than just uh, hectoring them in a way that they've been hectored before about, um, you know, something they've heard a lot. You come at it from a different angle. You say, well, let's talk about other planets. And then, oh, by the way, this relates to the future of our planet, you know? So I see people doing that in astronomy classes, and I think it's so fundamental to the nature of our existence on this planet now, it ought to be in the curriculum of every department. Like, how could you talk about economics without talking about the fact that if we don't change some of our assumptions of our global economy, then we're going to run into uh, much deeper trouble than we're already in? Or I think you could... It, it would be hard to come up with a department where it would not be relevant to what should be in the curriculum. So let me let me rephrase my question slightly. I understand the question of well, how do we how do we get to that change? That's of course one of the, the key questions. But as a thought experiment, if you were the czar of education, we, we'll go beyond the Secretary of Education, make it the czar of education in America. What kind of um, educational experience would you design for a high school student or for a college student? You don't have to market it. You just get to decide what's going to be implemented in, in your infinite wisdom. Yeah. Oh, what, man. What, it's what, such, what would you decide? It's such a great question. I think that um, I would want to teach the science in an integrated way with history and with um, ideas about uh, behavior change. And um, in other words, it's not enough to just say, here's what we know physically. 
how do we apply that to our problems? And what are the lessons from our history of having ignored problems or you know, what have we gotten right and what have we gotten wrong when we've tried to predict the future and tried to implement um, solutions. So I, I like the idea um, of uh, trying to integrate the physical sciences where you're going to learn about how climate works and learn about geology and comparative planetology and biology and uh, agriculture and all these related systems with um, ideas about uh, economics and um, international relations and behavior change, but also um, history. Um, I, I, this seems like a tall order, but uh, this would and be- Let's not leave out fiction and poetry. Oh, I, I, absolutely, I, absolutely. Yeah. Fiction and poetry, because the uh, imagination, you know, the, the famous Einstein quoted, that it's more important than knowledge. I don't even know more important, but you can't, you can't have one without the other and, and create meaningful change. You need both, right? So That's imagination right. is, is key. And so absolutely literature, um, arts, uh, fiction, poetry. Great. All right. Well, I, I will nominate you after the next election. <laughs> and I, I do think it's a really important question because it's, it's so easy um, for, I mean, for every institution, it, it, it establishes itself and it, it protects itself. And so it's very hard to change to it actual changing world and you know the 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 things that we needed to learn are different now than they were 100 years ago 50 years ago even 20 years ago our understanding of what is important is changing um so let's talk about some successful change um i'd like to talk about the ozone hole and you know it's a it's a amazing example of a place where we were doing something that was going to be very destructive to our species. I'll, we'll forget everybody else for a minute and just say, this wasn't going to go well for us. And, and we managed to, to reverse course. Could you talk about that? Yeah, the, the ozone hole is, is a really important and interesting story in, in so many ways. It's, it's just a classic example of unintended consequences. And then it's also an example of uh, a really important proof of concept of sort of a kind of course correction that, that we are capable of implementing. Um, you know, coming back just for a second to the concept of the Anthropocene, um, I talk in, in Earth and Human Hands about trying to define what's really different about the Anthropocene compared to all the different changes Earth has gone through. And I conclude that it's the first time that a geological force has been aware of its own existence. You know, there have been a lot of changes caused by life and a lot of um, changes, uh, uh, dramatic uh, geological chapters in the history of the Earth. But here we are, a new geological force, and we're actually looking around and going, oh, we're a geological force. Look at us. But then can we take it to the next step and say, seeing that we are a geological force and that we're changing the planet um, and seeing that there are some paths that we're on, as we've been discussing, which if we continue on them will be destructive, not just to ourselves and other species. Can we incorporate that awareness of ourselves as a geological force to be not just, uh, you know, to be self-aware in the deep sense where our behavior is uh, a result of that awareness? And um, so I, I talk about that as a fundamentally different kind of change. There's the kind of change where we are clever and building machines and um, and changing the planet without any long term plan or awareness of the consequences. And there's plenty of examples of that. <laughs> you know, like open the newspaper on any day. Uh, you know, that's climate change so far. We haven't we, we we can see that it's a problem, but we haven't really reined it in. And then there's the possibility of the another kind of change where we incorporate the knowledge of of the consequences of our actions into those actions and change course. And in searching for examples of that, I actually, I think there are a few examples, but the best example is the ozone layer, because that was a situation where it, you know, it was, it was innocent at first when, when these core fluorocarbons were introduced, they were introduced as environmentally safe alternatives to the refrigerants that were being used at that time, safe and healthy. And in fact, they were because before that, pe before then, people were using like ammonia and things like that in refrigerators, nasty stuff that was really poisonous. And these chemicals, CFCs, 
were chosen because they're chemically inert. They're safe because they don't react with anything. And it's true, they are. Here in the troposphere where we live, you can, there, if there were CFCs in this room, and there are some, <laughs> they're not doing anything. They don't react with anything. And so the scientists who created them and said, look, this is a safer alternative, they were right. But it's unintended consequences because nobody's smart enough to think about everything that's going to happen when, when you introduce something into the environment. And what they didn't realize was that, yeah, here down in the troposphere, these CFCs are perfectly safe. But if some of them leak up into the stratosphere, which eventually some of them will if you start using them widely enough, as we did. Then in the stratosphere, where there's more ultraviolet radiation, these CFCs, uh, something happens, ultraviolet knocks off some of the, the chlorines. CFCs are um, uh, chlorofluorocarbons, and the, the chloro, the chlorines are bound up in CFCs down here, so they're fine, they're not doing anything. But up there, the ozone knocks off some of those chlorines. Chlorines are very reactive atoms when they're not locked up in these molecules. And those chlorines start attacking the ozone up there. And, uh, and that's, that's dangerous. And by the way, another side note, part of the way we discovered that this was happening had to do with our investigating of the upper atmosphere of the planet Venus. Because there's this strange, uh, there was a mystery in the planet Venus, which was why wasn't there more oxygen up there, oxygen molecules? Because Venus is mostly carbon dioxide, the atmosphere. And in the upper atmosphere, the ultraviolet from the sun is breaking up CO2, so there should be some O up there. But the, the O molecules were missing. And some scientists said, well, we've observed some chlorine in the upper atmosphere of Venus. I bet the chlorine is, and they, they figured out the reactions by which chlorine was doing things to the oxygen cycle on Venus. And then some scientists on Earth happened to have read those papers about Venus. And they said, well, wait a minute, what about all this, this chlorine we're putting up in Earth's stratosphere now with these CFCs? And they said, oh, wait, wait a minute, uh-oh. And they checked it out, and indeed it was happening. And they sort of sounded the alarm. And then, of course, you see those famous images um, of the Earth from space in the ultraviolet, where you can see the ozone hole deepening and deepening through, you know, in the 1970s. And um, it was pretty classic because the, the, the debate about it then very much mirrored, in a lot of ways, the debate about global warming now, where some people who were supported by the industry said, oh, no, it's a hoax. And they put out, like, you know, fake scientific reports to in these front groups to say it was a hoax, which turned out that those front groups were supported by the corporations that were making the CFCs. And there was a, you know, there was a real cacophonous argument. But ultimately, the, the ozone hole deepened and deepened to the point where even the, you know, the, the executives at the DuPont Corporation got spooked. And they said, wait a minute, this is real. This is happening. And they came around and supported, ultimately supported what became the Montreal Protocol. Now, before they did that, mind you, they patented the replacement chemicals. <laughs> they saw that there was money to be made in being more responsible globally. And maybe that's okay. You know, I mean, we could get into the whole um, whether we want to question the, um, the tenets of capitalism. I'd be okay with that conversation. But even if we don't have to go that far, if people want to say, well, it's my enlightened self-interest to make money off of saving the world from this scourge, then that's an improvement over just wrecking the world. And at any rate, um, there was a global conversation that led to a global agreement, which was the uh, Montreal Protocol. Um, and it was successful. They, these uh, CFCs were banned. Compliance has not been perfect. There have been a few wrinkles that have come up with some of the other replacement chemicals being bad for, you know, being greenhouse gases. And, you know, it's still a work in progress. But the overall story is that the ozone hole, the ozone layer and the ozone hole are on track to being fixed now. They're improving. And it, it doesn't get fixed right away. Even if you stop all emission of these chemicals, the natural chemical cycles by which the ozone layer would repair itself takes about 50 years. So it's not an instant fix, but we can see it moving in the right direction now. And to me, it's a powerful example that we have it within ourselves uh, to respond to it in a different way, a more enlightened way to global problems. You know, it's yes. not it's not going to be easy. Uh, climate change is a harder problem in a lot of ways because there's, for one thing, there's a lot more of the global economy invested in fossil fuels than there ever were in 
in CFCs, but it shows it's a proof of concept that we can ultimately choose a course of action that um, is uh, not incompatible with our survival and which reflects a global awareness of a global problem and a global solution to that problem. So it's, to me, it's a very hopeful example. I, I agree. I agree and I appreciate it. So one of the things that this brings up is something that um, I think about a lot. When I started, uh, the Real Organic Project began as an attempt to bring greater integrity to the National Organic Program, a, a, a little program in the massive USDA. And um, it was an attempt at governmental reform. It failed. And so it became more about personal action, about people developing, um, you know, a, a more local economy. But I am struck by the fact that agriculture is a primary player, primary player in climate change. And, you know, some of the our great advocates are just coming to that understanding and others get it quite clearly. Paul Hawken, who wrote Drawdown, sees that very clearly. And, and we'll talk about it at the at the symposium, and I'll, I'll be interested to hear what Al Gore and Bill McKibben have. I think they've been moving there too. So if we accept that uh, agriculture is a primary player, it's not just burning fossil fuel, it's also how we manage the land, how we grow our food, how we manage the forest, how we relate to, to, the, to the oceans. Um, we, we end up this thing, and you, you describe it quite interestingly, you use the analogy of traffic, and we have, we have things where we have individual agency, so I could decide I'm only going to buy this food, but not that food, but some of the problems we face can only be dealt with collectively, and um, as Al Gore has famously said, yes, it's important to change the light bulbs, but it's more important to change the laws. So I'm curious, could you, could you riff a little bit on, say, your climate analogy of, of, uh, of putting that into traffic? Because that's a beautiful picture. Yeah, yeah. So, I, you know, I talk about um, inadvertent global change versus intentional global change as being really the key um, transformation that we are going to have to make. In other words, I think it's an illusion to say that we're going to, going to stop being planet changers in some way. The only way to do that would be to drastically reduce our numbers on this planet. And, we, you know, we could that's a separate conversation, you know, should we do that? But assuming that we're not going to do that, you know, the good thing is that it looks like global population is going to peak and then start to decline later this um, century. But there are going to be billions of us um, for quite some time, um, you know, barring some real disaster. And so... Um, given that, we can't not be planet changers and feed all those people and give um, all, especially giving all the people in developing countries a def decent quality of life. Um, some of them are going to want to, at least in some ways, I increase their footprint. At least they're going to, they deserve um, some level of energy use so they can have, um, you know, illumination at night and feel safe and, and refrigeration for, uh, for medications. You know, there's some basic level of energy use that you can argue um, is humane, right? So it's not about uh, ceasing to have any impact on the planet. It's about what kind of planet changers we want to be. And that, that's where I draw the distinction between inadvertent and intentional planetary change. And when I talk about inadvertent um, planetary change, I use the metaphor of traffic, as you say, because you think of these systems that we are participating in, but we don't necessarily have agency. So you look at uh, a road with traffic, and obviously everybody driving their individual car has agency over that car. We're quite good at that. Traffic works because we all, um, you know, can hit the brakes when we need to and steer when we need to. And um, everybody's driving their car um, and doing a decent job of it. But then you look at the global transportation system as a whole and you can ask, well, who's driving that? And the answer really is nobody. It's like it's kind of like um, we're sleepwalking on that scale. We're participating in it, but we're not really in control of it. And that's what I refer to as the Anthropocene dilemma. When you're 
scale of influence exceeds your scale of awareness, that's always unstable. And you can think of it even in terms of like human development and like the cognitive level of a child who has not yet achieved what we call situational awareness. So they're not fully aware of the consequences of their actions. So you think, think of like a, a kid going into a store with a big backpack on and they'll get excited and turn around and like knock over a rack of food or whatever because they're, they're just not being cognizant of the scale of their influence in that space. Um, that's humanity on the planet now. We have this influence that exceeds the scale of our awareness. So um, the challenge then is to learn to act on a scale that is at the same uh, level as, 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 our, uh, as our influence on the planet. If we're going to be um, having global consequences, then it's very dangerous if we're not acting with an awareness of, of sort of global action and planning. So this actually sounds like an addition to the, your ideal curriculum and a rather important one, which is how to, um, how to take people's... So Jonathan Safran Foer actually describes this. I don't know if you're familiar with his book, We Are the Weather, but um, he talks in a, a great deal about the difference between knowing and believing. And he said we know about climate change, but we don't believe in it. Because if we did believe it, we would live differently. It's, it's that simple. And, and I think it's the nature of the challenge, just as with the ozone layer, you might know about it, but you don't quite believe it. And um, because that wasn't so integral to how we live, it was easier to come up with a, a solution. This one really cuts to the quick of, of, you know, how do I go to work? What do I eat? How do I, you know, eat my house? It, it, it's everything that we, that we do in our lifestyle. Yeah, I've heard it likened to, um, you know, historically, um, Thomas Jefferson and slavery. He knew that... Um, he knew enough to know that slavery was wrong. You could see it in his writings, but he could not imagine himself living without it. So he lived with it in this sort of morally compromised way. He knew it, but he didn't believe it in the sense you're, you're describing. He didn't act on what he knew. And we live now in a society where we intellectually know that we are living in this way that's immoral in a similar way because it's it's uh of what it's doing for future generations but yeah. we have not uh incorporated that knowledge successfully yet into um our large-scale systems of um, commerce and transportation and agriculture and so um you know that's the challenge it's not enough to just um be able to, um, you know, give a good lecture about climate change. <laughs> you need to be able to convince people uh, to live in a certain way and convince others that they need to live in a certain way that we act on that knowledge. Yeah, right. So if we accept that we, in fact, are a geological force, and I think you have no doubt about that at this point, must we start to think differently about our actions and consequences? And, you know, this is, I think, the, the real core question of, of, uh, of the book, uh, Earth in Human Hands. Yeah, I think we must. I mean, you know, it's interesting. The, the phrase Anthropocene to describe the present or, you know, the future that we're moving into has been controversial. And it's led to um, a lot of pushback because some people think, well, it sounds arrogant uh, oh, here we are saying that we're the center of the universe. Why should we name a geological age after ourselves? Isn't that, you know, awfully uh, um, anthropocentric? Um, <laughs> and you could look at it that way, but you could also look at it as a sort of, um, I think of it as a kind of taking responsibility, that if we're going to uh, change the way we act on the planet um, en masse as, as a global whole, the first thing we have to do is really recognize what we've done up to this point and the role that we are playing. And by giving it a name, you are hopefully 
aiding that recognition. And the fact is, if you just look at the data of the way all these Earth systems are changing, um, human influence has become greater, you know, on an annual basis, how much stuff we move, how much mass of dirt we move around the planet. Humans move more dirt than earthquakes and volcanoes now. Or, you know, one stark fact that illustrates it, if you add up the amount of water behind all the dams in the world, you know, in reservoirs, um, and compare that to the amount of water left in all the wild streams and rivers on the planet, there's five or six times as much water now behind dams as there is left in wild streams. So that's not a minor tweak to the hydrological cycle. That's a whole recasting of it. And you go through our influence on the, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the sulfur cycle, all these, you know, it's, it's major. So we are a presence. And so I, I feel that it's a good term, the Anthropocene, because it forces us to recognize that we have become planet changers. And then it hopefully leads to the next question of what kind of planet changers do we want to be? You know, what do we have some choice in, in, in how we act on this planet? And I think that the recognition and putting it in geological terms also helps us to see ourselves in deep time. And part of our problem is not just a lack of global thinking, it's a lack of long-term thinking. You know, we are not only inherently, maybe almost cognitively local thinkers in a way that we have, we've had to culturally start to overcome, but we're also not really good at long-term thinking. We have to think beyond um, just our present circumstances and indeed our present generation. And this is, by the way, something that we can also learn from certain indigenous cultures who've been very good at that, um, at feeling the presence of their ancestors and their descendants and feeling their uh, connection with um, with global cycles and with, uh, you know, feel, very much feeling the uh, the presence of the biosphere as uh, as something real. Um, so it's not that we have to completely reinvent this, but in a scientifically informed context, we have to draw upon that that ability that some indigenous peoples have had to see ourselves in this context of being multi-generational and uh, beyond just the local so that we can behave in a way that's commensurate with what we really know about the planet. So I like the geological framing because it forces us to think about deep time and the way that what we do now will reverberate uh, far into the future and the way that the world we have now has been created by events that precede us uh, by, you know, not just a generation or two, but, but uh, uh, th that we, we are embedded in deep time. And the more we start to incorporate that into our consciousness and act upon it, uh, to me, that's a source of wisdom that we can, uh, we can really start to work with the planet rather than against it and, and really um, take our place within those cycles of uh, planetary functioning rather than obliviously think that we can um, just act in a way that ignores them. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I love um, in your discussion of Terra Sapiens that, you know, you're, you're offering a perspective that has some kindness to it. And uh, as you say, it's, it's, it's often that we react to our presence, our, our destructive presence as, um, you know, with, with almost rage and hatred. And, and I, of course, we are not excusing that. We're trying to find, I'm trying to find, how do we move beyond that? How do we be able to make choices that are wiser? And uh, I think that your, your vision of Terra Sapiens is exactly that. So maybe we could just close with that, David. What, could you talk a little bit about the childhood's end, about moving beyond our technological adolescence, as you've called it, and... Um, how you would imagine that might be? Yeah, well, one one thing I think I've gained from this perspective of really trying to understand us as part of planetary history is some sympathy for humanity. It's easy to look at the role we've been playing and, you know, the extinctions and the, you know, the unnecessary, uh, you know, climate change and, and sort of... Uh, 
take an anti-human stance and say, well, the world would just be better off if we were never here. And, you know, we we suck, basically. You hear that kind of anti-human message a lot in environmental um, messages. And it's understandable because you look at these things and you react with shock and horror and some some shame. And yet the perspective I've gained is that we're very new on this planet and we're finding ourselves in this role that we didn't necessarily choose. I mean, there was a time when we did not have this global presence and the world seemed infinite. It was functionally infinite when we were uh, less um, technologically uh, sophisticated and we didn't have as large a, a footprint and we were not as many in number. Uh, you could throw things away and they would, would go away. Right. And then and then we became more uh, we became better at manipulating the planet and, and surviving. And we became larger in number to the point where we spread around the whole planet. And we kind of ran into ourselves on the other side of the planet and realized, oh, there is no way you can't throw things away. But you can understand how we came up with that mentality before we were such a global presence. And so it's a matter of sort of uh, reinventing ourselves within that reality. But in terms of the deep time uh, perspective that I have, it's very new that, you know, that we've encountered ourselves in this way. And we, we have a lot to learn and there's, there's sort of no owner's manual for the planet. We have to figure it out. So I tend to look at the metaphors we often use to describe ourselves of like cancer and viruses and think, well, there's some truth to that. We've been a cancer. But let's not lock ourselves into that view of ourselves. Are there other metaphors that are also true? And I come up with metaphors of, of childhood and immaturity. We're, we're like orphans finding ourselves on, on a planet and, and there's no adult that's, that's, you know, that's here to show us how to, how to live here well. We have to figure it out ourselves. Um, and another metaphor that I use is this sort of unschooled driver. You're, you're, um, you're driving down a road in a big driving a big uh, truck and you sort of wake up at the wheel and go, oh, I'm driving a truck, but I don't know how to drive a truck. Um, and everything you love is in the back of the truck and you better not drive it off the road. That's humanity. We've found ourselves in this role where we're sort of driving this planet, but we don't know how to drive a planet. So we have to learn quickly how the planet works and how we can better interact with it. Um, but so there's sort of a, kind of an innocence that I feel like we've stumbled into this situation. Now, if we don't learn those lessons and we don't incorporate what we know pretty quickly, um, then, uh, you know, maybe this will cease to be a good metaphor. But I feel like it doesn't hurt to have some sympathy for humanity. You might call it sympathy for the devil if you want, but, um, it, you know, sort of realize that it's difficult what we're trying to do. We're trying to reinvent ourselves with no roadmap and figure out how to be good um, stewards or, or, or gardeners on a planet that um, in a way that's never been done before. And it's not completely obvious how to do it. So um, my view of Terra Sapiens is when we've successfully learned that those lessons and we have not uh, ceased to um, to be planet changers, but we've learned to integrate our actions with the cycles of the planet so that we're not working against it, we're working with it. And actually, ultimately, it'll be easier because the planet's a pretty powerful beast. And so rather than fight it, let's learn to sort of ride it and ride along with it and partner with it, dance with it, if you will. You know, there's, I, I know I'm mixing my metaphors because I think there's a lot of good ones, but they're uh, ones where we're not in conflict with those natural cycles, but acting in an awareness of them and using that awareness, not just to our own benefit, but ultimately to the benefit of other species. And this gets into that long-term vision where uh, ultimately I think we can be a positive presence on the earth, not just cease to be a negative one, but we can we can prevent the next mass extinction. If that next asteroid is heading towards the Earth, which it will eventually, we can give it a little nudge and say, no, we, we like Gaia. We want Gaia to live. Uh, let's use what we know to be protectors. 
And same thing in the very long run. And now we're, it's almost science fictional. I'm talking 100,000 years. But ultimately, there will be natural climate change, which is um, detrimental to the continuance, not just of human civilization, but of other species. I mean, we don't want to live through another ice age. And if we make it that 50,000 years and have the wisdom of learning how to having learned how to integrate ourselves well within the planet, there will be no reason why we can't, again, give the planet a little nudge and say, no, let's not do this next ice age. You know, so there may be a way that we can more gently and more wisely have some influence on the planet and and be a force for survival of the biosphere and not a force of destruction. And that's my view of Terra Sapiens. David Grinspoon, thank you so much for for talking with me. You've given me, and I hope many other people, lots to think about. Um, you know, we need, we need fresh eyes. And, and I think you suggest that we are at childhood's end as a species. And so thank you for, for pointing some ways to go forward. So thanks very much. Pleasure to talk you. with you. Thank you for listening to the Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you will subscribe Tell your friends and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you found us. A video version of this interview, as well as the full transcript with links related to today's conversation, is found at realorganicproject.org forward slash episode 30. Please join us next time for an interview with Fred Provenza, Professor Emeritus of Behavioral Ecology at Utah State University and author of Nourishment, What Animals Can Teach Us About Rediscovering Our Nutritional Wisdom. To find a real organic farm near you, visit realorganicproject.org forward slash farms.